Vice President for Global Privacy at the Future of Privacy Forum, which is a think tank based in Washington, D.C., with offices in Brussels, Tel Aviv, and Singapore, but also with a very recent presence in Africa, in fact. We have a colleague uh, based in Nairobi in Kenya. Um, I am very happy to be here. I literally landed in Brussels one hour ago, so I hope I will be making sense because I'm, I'm flying from the United States. But I wanted to be here because I think this is such an important conversation and this is uh, such a wonderful conference that uh, the European Data Protection Supervisor has put together. And I wanted to be part of that conversation. The panel we are proposing uh, for you today is a panel that is looking at um, the role that enforcement plays in establishing a golden standard that inspires uh, regulatory regimes around the world. When the organizers proposed uh, this topic, they had in mind the concept of the Brussels effect. And I think this is a concept that most of you have heard. Well, the way I uh, have heard uh, of, the way I understand the Brussels effect is that if it would have a poster child, that poster child would be the GDPR. Um, as you know, this law has been extraordinarily influential around the world. The GDPR significantly boosted and streamlined something that Directive 95 per 46 has started um, with its requirements to, um, uh, for an adequate level of protection in foreign jurisdictions that wanted to import personal data. Um, what happened after 2018, when the GDPR became applicable around the world, is that we have seen how from Brazil to Kenya to Thailand very recently, to California, to China, all of these jurisdictions have adopted comprehensive or baseline data protection laws. Um, and we have also seen reforms of existing data protection and privacy laws in South Korea, in Japan, in Singapore, we have seen currently bills that have been proposed in India, in Indonesia. Even in the United States at federal level, we very recently um, saw a bill that's bipartisan and that actually has some chances to pass finally. They have a lot of things in common and one can clearly see the influence of the GDPR in defining their key, key concepts, uh, in proposing their legal structure, uh, proposing in the enforcement structure, we have seen the concept of a dedicated data protection authority coming back and back again in most of these frameworks. And uh, the effect of the GDPR over all of these jurisdictions around the world is, is clearly visible. But the question that this panel will try to uh, explore is whether the GDPR effect and the influence that the European Union data protection law has been having around the world can still stand and can continue to manifest and evolve if its enforcement does not raise to the expectations that were set around 2016, 2018, when the law was adopted and then became effective. So if enforcement is not as strong, as visible, as consequential for the way the rights of individuals are respected with regard to the processing of their personal data, um, would the Brussels effect still stand? So we are trying to explore that and see whether that, that is uh, something that will be happening or not. For this, we have gathered a panel of extraordinary experts. Um, I'm very honored to introduce Professor uh, Anu Bradford, Professor of Law and International Organizations at Columbia Law School in uh, New York, and author of the book on the Brussels effect, mm -hmm. How the European Union Rules the World, uh, which was published in 2020. Um, we also have uh, with us today Thomas Zeldik, uh, who is head of enforcement at the European Data Protection Supervisor and who also has credentials working for the uh, Directorate General of Justice in the European Commission and in the Cabinet of Commission's first Vice President, Franz Timmermans. Welcome, uh, Thomas. Uh, very honored to um, have join us today Teki Akuete, founder and executive director of the Africa Digital Rights Hub. Uh, and senior partner at a law firm based in Accra in Ghana. Previously, uh, Teki was uh, the first executive director of the Data Protection Commission of Ghana. Welcome. Thank you. 
And last but absolutely not least, uh, we also are joined by Hilke Heimans, a president of the litigation chamber and member of the executive board of the Belgian Data Protection Authority. Uh, Hilke is also a professor at Freie Universität Brussels and lecturer at the University of Luxembourg and one of my former bosses, <laughs> the European Data Protection Supervisor. Um, welcome, everyone. And for the first round of questions, we will start with the obvious one. And perhaps if we have uh, Professor Bradford uh, connected. That's cool. <laughs> the Good afternoon, everyone. Oh. Wonderful. Can you hear me fine? We, we can hear you. Um, OK, wonderful. So, unfortunately, um, we cannot see you, but uh, we, we can hear you. Yeah, 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 now yeah. we can see you. Yeah. Now we can see you. It's wonderful. Um, the, question, the question is, what is the Brussels effect? So, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to share this conversation that I consider to be one of the most important ones, not just for Europe, but for us in the United States and, and for the rest of the world. So I think you did a wonderful job in, in defining the Brussels effect. But the way I define it as a phenomenon is that I, I talk about the Brussels effect as an, a mechanism that explains how the European Union is able to unilaterally regulate the global marketplace. So the EU is one of the largest and wealthiest consumer markets in the world. And there are very few global companies that can afford not to trade in the EU. So as the price for accessing the European market, these companies need to follow the European regulations. That is not surprising. But often these companies conclude that it is in their business interest to extend the European regulations across their global conduct or across their local services and production because they want to avoid the cost of complying with multiple different regulatory regimes. So by adhering to the most stringent excuse me, the highest rule, these companies can basically have a uniform policy and be in compliance across the world. So because the normally the most stringent rules, like in the domain of data privacy, emanate from the European Union, that has put the EU in the position of basically providing the global regulatory framework. And what is interesting here is that the EU does not need to do anything but regulate the single market. It is then the market forces and the business interests of these companies that are transposing these EU regulations like data privacy across the world. So we have some of the most powerful tech companies, including Google, Microsoft, Apple, Meta, former Facebook, using GDPR as their global privacy policy. So we talk about several billion users that are benefiting from the European privacy, uh, privacy law. But at the same time, we also, this is what I call the de facto Brussels effect, this market-driven effect whereby we don't even need the countries around the world to change their data protection regulations because the global companies bring these, uh, th these benefits to the users. But we also have something that I call the jure Brussels effect which refers to countries, the governments around the world, also replicating, emulating the European regulations. And this is what is also happening. So today we have about 150 countries around the world that have a domestic data protection law. And in most instances, this is closely resembling the GDPR. So the GDPR has become the kind of global standard. It go, it's way past the tipping point whereby any government adopting a law that differs from the GDPR would almost have this burden of proof that is there another standard that would be justifiable. So it really has been that the Europeans have also provided for the legislators around the world. And I think you, you, uh, you did a wonderful job in, in describing how diverse set of countries in diverse geographic regions have then followed the European model. And there's also, we all know about the adequacy process being a, a strong impetus for the countries then to have the domestic regulatory framework that resembles the EU's uh, framework. So this further institutionalizes across the world uh, the, the Brussels effect as the norm. 
Thank you very much, um, Anu, for, for um, laying out so uh, clearly uh, the concept and the two prongs of the Brussels effect, the de facto and the de jure one. And um, I will go now to Teki, uh, perhaps touching on that second prong of de jure uh, Brussels effect. And I would like you to invite to um, let us know how did the Brussels effect manifest in Africa? Um, and I, I am aware that uh, I am asking you to um, look across a whole continent that is very diverse. Uh, and, and please feel free to only refer to Ghana. Um, but of course, we are cu curious to go a bit broader than that. Um, and, and in a way, I would also like you to uh, go beyond that and perhaps push back a bit and, and tell us where, where do you see that the European influence um, had some pushback locally? Where do you see that the local culture has actually um, mattered when data protection law concepts have been uh, adopted in Africa? Okay, thank you very much for having me here. And, and I think you put the context right. Africa is a continent of 55 countries, and, and that's probably about one of the largest continents on the globe. So I like to put that in context. It's very uh, different. And we have uh, different um, legal systems and structures across the many countries of the continent. Um, but definitely, um, Africa also experienced um, the, the Brussels effect. But I must say, even pre-GDPR, um, the continent's relationship with Europe has always influenced, and, and this dates back to uh, pre-colonial and even colonial times, which has influenced a lot of our legal systems and structures. And so you are likely to see, even in terms of the, the legal systems that we have, uh, whether it's the Lusophone, whether it's the common law, and all of that, you see these legal systems have predominantly been influenced by Europe. And so pre-GDPR, at the continent level, you would see that one of the key um, conventions that we have, unfortunately, it hasn't come into effect yet, at the AU level and even at the community levels across West Africa, East, North, and Central Africa have mostly been influenced by Directive 95. And, and so naturally, you can see the GDPR effect there. But I must say that one of the, the striking things of the Brussels effects was the extraterritorial reach that I, I like to say of the law. And so right after GDPR came into effect, even countries that did not have data protection laws, what we started seeing were companies that were doing businesses uh, with African companies requiring them to comply with the laws. And so you're likely to be in a country that doesn't even have data protection laws, and yet you are required either by contractual obligations or the like to comply with aspects of the GDPR law. We saw this a lot with legal practice practice where suddenly lawyers were being asked to put in place uh, processes, they were asked to uh, to show uh, their data protection impact assessments for their firms because they're processing information of Europeans on behalf of businesses that were operating in Europe. And so we saw that, and this actually led to increased awareness also of data protection issues in countries that have the law, but also countries that do not have. And what we subsequently saw with um, countries, I think one of the first to adopt a GDPR-like law was Mauritius, um, where they completely overhauled their laws and then adopted the GDPR-like law. Um, but subsequently, it has become some sort of a golden standard. Um, and so we saw the likes of Kenya, the likes of Nigeria, and, and many other countries adopting laws thinking about um, you know, GDPR in terms of how they structure and implement their law. 
the the pushback however is that if you if you look at gdpr it's coming from somewhere it's based on a certain history and whilst we are free to not reinvent the wheel we also face this challenge of writing our own stories and gdpr is based on the experience of europeans and it is based on the community that has highly been a human rights based community which you know has developed in that light we do not have a lot of that across africa we we're now seeing you know our democracies are now growing we're now seeing human rights centered approaches to a number of issues and so implementation of a gdpr like law without the resources that it required uh, without the expertise that it requires without the back experience then creates a sort of a conundrum you know even for the countries that have applied that because prior to gdpr if you're looking at the 95 directive you know the there was you have grown from somewhere so essentially what we african countries that have adopted the gdpr effect are trying to say is they want to run before they crawl or or leap and and that is almost impossible you know it is a good model law to work with but i believe that it must be tailored to suit you know our communities and where we are coming from thank you so much for sharing uh, that perspective techie um and um i will just pick on one of uh, pick up not pick on but pick up one of the points you you lastly made because this makes a very nice transition to my question for thomas and you were mentioning about uh, how could one implement a law without the resources and i um, since this uh, panel is also supposed to be about enforcement um talking about resources of enforcing a law uh, thomas my question for you is how would you characterize effective enforcement what uh, are some of the core elements of an of an enforcement regime and the conse consequences of enforcement that uh, you see um, define effectiveness thanks gabriel and good morning everyone um i think you're asking the ultimate uh, question and that is really what is the ultimate objective of effective enforcement of data protection law um I think we all agree that you have reached an effective enforcement of data protection law, but not only data protection law, when a breach of the law actually comes to an end. And it's, it cannot be unenforced law. Unenforced laws are dead letter laws, are uh, symbolic laws, are um, irrelevant laws. And I think, I hope, we all agree that data protection cannot be an unenforced law, a symbolic law, since data protection is a fundamental right. So um, I believe in, in Europe, and uh, we hear globally, worldwide, data protection supervisory authorities realize that you need to have five components to achieve effective enforcement. Um, the first component, obviously, is that whatever you do as an authority, as a regulator, needs to be effective. It means you need to bring the breach to an end. It needs to stop. Um, but that's not only it. It also needs to be proportionate. Whatever you do, it has to be not too soft. It cannot be too strong. Um, and that is, of course, proportionate in relation to the breach. Um, you should not be using a one-size-fits approach, one-size-fits-all approach to whatever comes your way. But ultimately, as a supervisory authority, when you do enforce, that enforcement also needs to be dissuasive. Um, so that the breach doesn't happen again. So that the controller or the processor, whoever is at the receiving end, knows, okay, this has hurt, I shouldn't do it again, and it will not happen again. I think those were the three classical components for effective enforcement, but as I said again, there are at least two more. 
and I would submit one is visibility. Um, it must be seen that the law is being enforced. Because if you don't see that data protection law is enforced, many people will start to think, oh, it is actually unenforced, it's dead letter law, and that would not be good. So it must, it must, your enforcement actions must be visible. And I think a fundamental point, um, and that's the last component, the enforcement must be consistent. If you want effective enforcement, it must be consistent. What does this mean? If you are living in a country with different jurisdictions, the enforcement must be consistent in all of those jurisdictions. Um, and in particular, in the European Union, it must mean that the enforcement of the same law must be consistent from one member state to the other. And again, why is that? Um, is it because the law says so? No, because in our case, data protection is a fundamental right and it shouldn't make any difference where you live, where you work, where you are, in which member state. Your fundamental right should be enforced the same way. Um, I think you also had a question, you hinted at ultimately what do we do? Um, is it all about fines? Is it only fines which can ensure effective enforcement? Um, well, yes, to a certain extent, as you all know, the European data protection reform had that as an essential component. From experience, from the 95 directive, there, was, there were not enough data protection supervisory authorities which had the fining sanctions as a possibility, and the GDPR wanted to learn from that. So fines are an essential component, but it's not only fines. Um, a supervisory authority has and should have, not only in Europe, but again globally, many tools in, in the toolbox. Why is that? Because as we all know, if you're all practicing data protection, situations are never black and white. Um, and therefore, in order to respond proportionately, in order to respond effectively, you have a wide range of tools. You can start an investigation. That in itself is a, a big shock for some entities and organizations. You can come with recommendations. So not a fine, but a recommendation, which is also helping to enforce because it will change attitudes and controllers. But ultimately, a supervisory authority which uses corrective powers uh, has actually the power of the law, the force to make controllers or processors comply with an order, with a ban on processing, with a ban of transfers, with an order to delete, and yes, ultimately with an administrative fine. Um, this is the toolbox, and at, at least um, at European level, what I guess we would also need very much are criminal sanctions. Some of the member states already have criminal sanctions for violations of data protection laws. You can actually go to jail. Like any other violations of different laws, if you do something wrong there, you can go to jail. I think that's something we need to consider as well. But to conclude, um, effective enforcement means all of this. It's not only fines. You need to have those five components as a regulator, as an authority, and then you can actually do effective enforcement in your jurisdiction. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Thomas, for sharing that perspective. And now that we have an idea of how effective enforcement looks like, um, I will turn to Hilke. I will not ask to measure. I will not ask you to measure the enforcement of the GDPR to these five components because that's not our purpose today uh, for the panel. But I will ask you to look a bit at the one-stop shop. And um, since we are supposed to talk about how uh, the GDPR has effects in jurisdictions around the world, my question is whether the one-stop shop can be replicated outside of the European Union. Also, should it be replicated? What is it that makes the one-stop shop unique? And I'm sorry if with that I already preempted a bit of your answer. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you very much, Gabriela. It's a pleasure to be here and proud to be here at the EDPS conference. A wonderful initiative, I think. Thank you, Wojciech. Uh, 
happy to be here. It, it's an interesting start of this panel. With, we talked about the law, the effect of the law, then we talked about why we should enforce and how, and now I'm going to explain more in detail what the cross-border enforcement means. So there is a clear line in this panel. Uh, I'm changing the order of your questions because you asked me should we rep replicate it. First, I want to say what is the one-stop shop and why is it unique? Just as a reminder, the one-stop shop is a uh, is tries to reconcile two different, two completely different opposite objectives. Uh, having a level playoff field all around the European Union, combined with proximity and national specificities. Specificities. So that's the mission for the for the. DPAs, for I'm a member of one of the DPAs here in Europe, is to make this, to reconcile these two different perspectives. And this mission, sometimes I think it's hardly impossible to, to do it right. It's such an important, such a difficult mission to reconcile these two different objectives. But we want to make it work and we will make it work. I think one of the remarks I took from Paul Nemitz this morning, he said, well, you authorities, sh you should make in a democracy, it's your task to ensure that the law is, is enforced. And I think that's what our role is indeed. Uh, and I think uh, what I didn't agree with with the first panel, I think we don't do it so badly, I think. There's a lot happening. There's a lot happening. We do a lot and we really are enforcing. Uh, so it's not just that we are here just doing nothing all the time. If you had the idea from that first panel, no, that's not the case. Uh, Thomas talked about visibility. I think there's maybe at that respect something to, to, to win. Uh, bringing me back to the one-stop shop mechanism, this impossible mission, uh, it's about enforcement, so it should be effective enforcement. It should also ensure a system where the lead authority, the lead authority, the main authority taking a case really cooperates and exchanges and provides assistance and works together with other authorities. I'll come back to that. That's extremely important. It's also should be clear that decisions should be taken in this one sub shop mechanism. And I think a lot of, of decisions are being taken. When you have the EDPB secretary, oh, they always come with numbers. I should have talked to them before I didn't, but there are quite a number of decisions taken within one sub shop mechanisms. The other point is, that's what the law says clearly, an endeavor to reach consensus. That's the main goal of this one sub shop mechanism. So we should talk to each other as DPAs, talk as SAs in enforcement cases, and try to get all the same views and get, reach consensus on what is important and what is not important. And I think that's the key of it all. Uh, so how could it work or what, uh, what doesn't work? I think important, we had an, an important case uh, which we dealt with as Belgian DPA as lead, the case on IAB Europe, many of you will know about it. And we tried to ensure a few things to make it work. First, to be Early in, in early in the involvement of other DPAs. We talked to them from the beginning to the end. We tried to manage this process. So early involvement. Also being clear, and that's not so easy, about the constraints of cases. We all do these cases in a national jurisdiction, subject to national procedural law and subject to national judges, courts. So we, we had requests at the end. Can you not extend this case also, for instance, to uh, cross-border transfers, to international transfers? And then we had to say, no, we then we have to open the case because the case was not about this subject. So constraints, you must be honest about it. You must trust each other, that's the third point. And I think that's what we try to do as DPAs. We, as we already mentioned this morning, we went all to Vienna. We had a very, very, uh, very good meeting where we said to each other, we looked each other into the eye and said to each other, we should trust each other. And I think trust is key as well. And of course, and last point, because it's extremely cumbersome, this whole this whole one job mechanism, that we should use it strategically, mainly for the big cases and in a strategic way, and not have all these small cases coming into the system and, and, and make it a bureaucratic monster. That's what we should avoid. Uh, I, I once earlier said, what, what is the key to make it work? Do not wait until the end. Do not surprise your colleagues. Do not rush. It takes time. And do not make promises to anyone, not to, not to controllers and not to NGOs. That's about what it is. Is it unique? Uh, 
should or could it be replicated? Uh, I think the main question is not whether or not this system should be replicated, but to ensure that we can work together as DPAs, ensuring uh, ensuring uh, consistent enforcement throughout the world. We have global problems. There is a digital society. We, have, we 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 work with players, and then. Enforcement is not only about big tech, but part of it is about it. They, they operate globally, so also, uh, also, also enforcement should operate globally. And I think the same concerns we have in Europe to ensure level, level playing field exists also far beyond the European Union, although everyone with his own African or other perspectives, of course. So we are, we are already different in Europe, and I think there's other other. Uh, cultures even much more different than ours. So, of course, we should take that into into account. There are, of course, of course, differences how to make a global system work, how to replicate it. In the European Union, we have we have a strong European Union, so we can dream, and not only dream, we can work on uh, central enforcement. But I think outside the EU, uh, uh, cross-border enforcement, and to make it really work, is a dream. But it should be a bit more than a dream. Still, also there. Uh, so, yes, I think there, there are many good things you can learn from this system. I think it's good to, to replicate is, is a big thing, but you can learn a lot of it. And I think also based on the experiences we have, uh, I think it's good to think about it also beyond the European Union. Thank you very much, Hilke, for, for sharing uh, these thoughts. And we will remain in the area of effective enforcement and the area of what's the role of effective enforcement generally in the Brussels effect. So to this uh, end, um, I would like to go back to Anu and ask, how is the effectiveness of enforcement of a particular law, so general enforcement of, of, of uh, European law, influencing in one way or another the Brussels effect? Is there any difference that can be made between, let's say, paper, paper tiger laws and laws that have been successfully enforced when it comes to the Brussels effect? Um, so thank you, Gabriela. I think uh, it, it has been an extremely helpful conversation. And I would say that if we have Thomas's criteria of when we have effective enforcement um, is when we actually are protecting individuals' right to data privacy, we are clearly failing. So we still have tremendous amount data privacy breaches where we feel that the enforcement of the GDPR is, failing, uh, is falling short. And in that instance, we also have the Brussels effect that is less effective. We are effectively influencing the policies of the companies in paper and the, the laws in books. But if we are not influencing the laws in actions, we are actually not accomplishing the fundamental goal of the GDPR and the lost opportunity through the Brussels effect to effectively also influence the global marketplace. So we are letting not only European digital citizens down, but we are also letting uh, many citizens around the world down who are trusting and who've taken some comfort in the Brussels effect and the leadership of the European Union. And here, if I'm critical of the enforcement of the GDPR, let me say two things as a caveat. First of all, it is the supporters and the friends of the GDPR that need to be its most honest critics so that we can improve it. And second, let me fully acknowledge that this is not an easy problem to solve, and it is not just uh, relating to data privacy, but all the different domains of digital regulation that the European Union is generating. Whether we talk about competition policy, whether we talk about the plans to regulate the AI, the enforcement is going to be challenging. And, and I think I am in the position, I am not an enforcer, so I can ask for more money for the enforcement agencies with the kind of objectivity that I think the case is there, that the resources of the data protection authorities need to be uh, enhanced. So if you think about, for instance, the enforcement burden of the Irish Data Protection Authority, when the GDPR came into force, the budget of the Irish Data Protection Agency, the annual budget, was about the same that the revenue that the digital companies based in Dublin make every 10 minutes. It is not easy to enforce data protection law against these companies. 
Another interesting comparison, if we think about the size of these biggest digital companies, and I'm now for a moment focusing on the big tech, uh, the American companies. So Apple's, uh, uh, the market cap exceeded three trillion in January 22. That basically makes Apple, if you compare that to the GDPs of the countries, Apple would be the five largest country in the world. Only the United States and China and Japan and Germany have a GDP that exceeds the market cap of Apple. So it is not an easy task to be expecting to enforce data protection against these very big companies. And also, if you think about the way the Europeans are regulating, and this is absolutely the right way, they are committed to due process, they are committed to democracy. It is much easier for the Chinese government to crack down on big tech companies because they don't have those constraints. That, 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 that stem from the European commitment to, your, uh, to, to rule of law and democracy and, and due process. So I am not for a moment suggesting that the data protection agencies would not be competent, committed, and wouldn't have the right vision and the skills, but they do have a hard problem and they need all the support, including the resources that they deserve. So let me now say a couple of uh, words about the, what, what I would like to see and what I think are some of the biggest uh, arguments and debates going on about the, the enforcement of the, the GDPR. So one thing is that what we really need is that we need to figure out how the regulators in Europe and elsewhere can reclaim democratic control over the tech industry. So what we do see is ineffective enforcement in many domains of, of the, the, the digital uh, economy. And, and I see that uh, some, for instance, in America are really worried about overregulation coming from, from the EU. I'm not worried about overregulation of the GDPR as such. I'm currently worried about under enforcement of the GDPR. So instead of the sort of reining in the regulatory impulses, I think the Europeans need to double down and follow through, most importantly. So really not just promulgate these regulations, but really enforcement effectively. But that comes with the caveat. It is very important that the Europeans regulate, keeping very clearly in mind the goals of these regulations. Like with the GDPR, we are there to protect the fundamental right to privacy. There is a new tone in some of the conversations in Europe, and that does worry me to some extent, that we are moving towards this kind of idea of a strategic autonomy, digital sovereignty, technological sovereignty. We are enforcing and generating rules in the shadow of the US-China tech war. And there is uncertainty and, and, and sort of volatility and, and the element uh, uh, that, that I understand is driving this conversation. But I do worry about the move towards techno-nationalism and techno-protectionism and calls for, for instance, data localization. And here, I would remind everyone that the Brussels effect is an effective tool to export good and bad regulations alike. And if the Europeans, for instance, start moving towards data localization, it will also easily become a global norm. And that will not serve the interest of the Europeans and, uh, and the, uh, the, the countries and the digital citizens around the world. So my call first is for effective enforcement, but enforcement that is squarely focused on the values that these regulations are ought to advance and not be used as a tool for sort of geopolitic, uh, geopolitics or industrial policy or harness for tech, not nationalist impulses. My second uh, uh, comment I wanted to, to bring up that some say that, look, we don't really need the regulators, that the private companies do this. And they cite the example, which I think is a good example, um, the Apple's decision, for instance, to make a change in its devices to ask the users whether they want to be tracked. And we know how upset companies like Facebook were when suddenly their business model that is exploiting the user's data is unraveling. And the numbers in which the users chose not to be tracked really clearly conveying their preference for greater data privacy. So one could say that the single decision by a tech company was much more effective than all those fines and enforcement decisions by regulators combined. 
So that might be the case. Facebook is much more willing to pay fines to all the regulators than ask Apple, than, than basically face the situation that Apple is asking the users whether they want to be tracked. But I would be very careful. In this instance, yes, Apple was committed to working towards the same goal as the, the regulators and the data protection authorities in Europe and beyond. But ultimately, we cannot outsource this enforcement to the markets and to the tech companies and be at the mercy that the data privacy is only as strong as their business interests in any given time allow that protection to be. Because ultimately, these companies do care about their profit. They are not uh, uh, vested with the same societal objective as the regulators are. So we can harness sometimes the tech companies to, to fight other tech companies and advance some of these values. But ultimately, that doesn't mean that the regulators are redundant. Let me end with a, a, a why, why I think the stakes are particularly high in succeeding in the actual enforcement of data privacy around the world. I see currently that the regulators in Europe are fighting a two-way battle. One is that we have a battle in terms of how we regulate the digital economy where we have the European rights-driven model competing against this American market-driven model and the Chinese state-driven model. So the question is that the Chinese state-driven model is gaining a lot of currency around the world. Many countries are, are adopting a Chinese way also of thinking about uh, the, the regulation of the, the digital economy, which is not as rights protecting, which does include, for instance, extensive government surveillance that many countries, authoritarian in particular, around the world are welcoming. So we will not only be losing the fight for privacy, but we also would be losing the fight for democratic governance of our digital societies if we lose the horizontal battle to the Chinese state-driven model. But there's also the vertical battle, the battle against tech companies. And it's another way to lose that the fight over democracy in addition to privacy. If the regulators cannot show that they actually control that the tech companies as opposed to let in practice the American market driven model to win because we cannot enforce laws like the GDPR. So in that sense, I think the stakes are very high because if you think about, for instance, the Chinese regulators and their ability to crack down the tech industry, they will be able to enforce their privacy law to the extent that they want. The companies will be complied, but we need to show that it is possible to have a democratic governance model that is also effective. So in that sense, I think the stakes are very high. We need to protect privacy, but we also need to show to the world that there is an effective democratic way to govern the digital world. I'm sorry you cannot see me here because I'm applauding uh, silently. Um, that was such a rich uh, intervention and, and uh, so many rich ideas. Thank you very much for that. I think uh, I spotted at least three topics for further panels, uh, but I would particularly want to applaud the call against data protectionism as someone that, that works in the global space. Um, I, I think that is, that is a real threat, so thank you for that. And, and then the call for um, um, democratic governance and showing that democratic governance is actually workable and can work. Um, thank you again. But to move back towards uh, our conversation for this particular uh, panel and, and um, about um, effective enforcement and, and the Brussels effect, one other thing that um, you mentioned were, was that the Euro Europe is effectively influencing the policy and the laws but not necessarily the law in action in, in, in the jurisdictions where um, it has an effect. So I would like to go to Teki now, uh, also reminding the entire panel that we have about 20 more minutes, uh, so perhaps uh, we, we can trim a bit the conversations from the five to three minutes so we can take at least one question from the audience. Um, how would you describe the current environment of enforcement of data protection law in African jurisdictions? Um, what do you think would make the enforcement uh, more effective? It is a matter of funding, of capacity building. Uh, can you give us a sense of, of uh, what is happening? Okay, so let me, let me start on, on a rather light note, okay? 
Um, so let's say that GDPR was a style of clothing uh, that somebody wears. And um, Africa, African countries, um, have limited resources to sew, let's say, a mini skirt. Okay, everybody identifies with a mini skirt. And yet, um, GDPR's style of clothing is maybe a long, flowing dress. There is no way under the sun we can sew out of the cloth we have for a mini skirt this long, flowing cloth. And, and that comes to a statement that um, we say often in Africa that you cut your, you know, your clothes, uh, your cloth according to uh, your size, right? You cut your clothes according to the size that you have. Um, enforcement of GDPR-like laws, as we have heard today, entails a lot of things. Even the basic data protection law entails a lot. And if you look at African countries, especially those that have data protection laws, I would say that implementation um, or enforcement is infantile. If, you know, that's not to say, I mean, the reality is that it's non-existent. It's non-existent. But at best, you can say it's infantile because there are laws and there are companies that are showing some uh, kind of enthusiasm towards enforcing the laws. And that's because enforcement actually entails sets of actions that we take. And it goes beyond the regulators. It, it deals with citizenry. It deals with um, you know, private companies that are required to comply with this law. Now, there are a number of factors that I would say will lead to effective enforcement of these laws. And the first of those factors are resources. Um, let me give you an example. I remember when um, our government at the time, I was handed a law that I'd facilitated in the passage of. It wasn't even as comprehensive as a GDPR-like law. Uh, without resources to implement the law. It was indeed a challenge and almost impossible because invariably, as a consultant that was advising government on the propriety of those laws to ensure trust, I was now placed in a position where I need to make the law work. What did that mean? It meant that I have to have the technical capabilities to make the law work. I had a very limited uh, knowledge, of course, of information security and law. I didn't have the technical people that can support me. If I'm taking on any of the big technology companies in Ghana, I did not have the resources to fight them or to even match their expertise. And, and I take an experience that we had uh, back in the day during the telecoms liberalization. I remember the then telecom regulator had to succumb um, to um, views expressed by the telecom companies that interoperability was not feasible just because it did not have the technical capability at the time. So that is really what you are facing as a regulator when you do not have the required resources. You also need resources for those around the implementers to work. The average, let's take the ordinary person, uh, what kind of resources do they need to even enforce the laws? Uh, there's a challenge of even language, right? So if I take the ordinary citizen in Ghana who does not necessarily speak English, uh, they have to understand what data protection is. They should be able to make complaints on that basis for us to move forward without the capability of explaining to them what data protection is in the language that they understand and giving them tools to access um, either the, the, the regulator or the, um, the private company, this is almost impossible. If you want to take it a step further and you say that the law gives them the power to go to court, it takes an average of close to five years, at least in Ghana, to fight basic, and that's excluding cost 
and that's money. Um, so how many ordinary citizens can afford to do that? Um, the other thing you have to take into consideration is the knowledge and skill that is required to. Um, as we speak right now, uh, the entire continent of Africa has only a handful of uh, data protection experts. Not to speak of even the technologies that we are talking about, whether it's AI, whether we only have a handful of experts. So the question is, do we even have the right capacity within the regulator, outside of the regulator to really make this ecosystem work. We also have a challenge of, you know, the integrity of the regulator. We are a burgeoning democracy. And as we, we are seeing, and sometimes we continue to question ourselves with these democracies, uh, whether, you know, democracy is really working for Africa, we're seeing a lot of political influence and interference in how state structures and systems are set up and how they work. And so it's invariably, it's invading almost all state institutions, but that also includes data protection. What then tends to happen is that the integrity of these institutions are waned. And so it creates the impression that, you know, nothing will happen if you have the political backing. I'll give you an example. Um, around the election year, I believe in 2016, our Electoral Commission committed, you know, a great flaw. And, and the public were very outraged. However, the response of the regulator to such an issue raised eyebrows, you know, from the public. And, and these are some of the things that, you know, raise issues. Of course, you want to talk this morning, I think we had this whole issue about um, justice delivery and an effective justice system. I've spoken about how long courts cases take. Um, just multiply it by cost. You know, how many not-for-profit organizations, apart from the fact that there are very few across the continent that are really pushing for digital rights and, and privacy related, how many of them can take up a lot of these cases to see to its logical conclusion? There are only a few. Now, one of the biggest challenges I think we've had and I've seen with our enforcement is that most of the laws that we have, um, very similar to Directive 95, have criminal sanctions. So it's based heavily on criminal fines. And, and the administrative fines are almost non-existent, apart from, I think, a handful of countries currently in Africa that have these laws. Now, the biggest challenge you will face when you have uh, criminal sanctions is also enforcement of those sanctions. Um, most data protection regulators are reluctant, unless in extreme cases, to take up criminal sanctions. And I always give this example of, you know, um, a, a requirement to register, which is very fundamental at the time we started implementing. And then we went to court and the fine, you know, that was given because of course the head of the institution is not going to be imprisoned. But then the fine was ridiculous. I don't think it amounted to a total of even $100 today, apart from the embarrassment value but it had taken us close to six months uh, to work with um, the prosecutor's office, work with the police to even, um, you know, apply this sanction. So invariably, it's almost impossible. Well, what other rights do you have? You have a right to write and, and, you know, push for certain actions to be done. But because the you know, integrity of these institutions are questioned and they do not have that necessary political clout and backing. A lot of the time, when you use the other enforcement mechanisms, notices and, and requirements, you are ignored. And so your next step is to take it to court and you do not have the resources. So that's just to say that, yes, the, the laws look beautiful on the book, but in reality, it takes a lot. And for a continent um, like Africa with our many countries, I, I think it really brings us to the point where we need to question what is the right, you know, way 
of making sure that these laws work for our people. Thank you for giving us a reality check, Teki, uh, on, on uh, the, the Brussels uh, effect and, and that gap that exists between uh, exporting the policy and the standards and then how it actually uh, ends up uh, being implemented and the challenges there. Um, I will point out that we have about 10 minutes. But I have two more questions to, to uh, raise. Um, uh, Thomas, we're looking to towards um, a new generation of data laws. I do not know how to call them, data governance, uh, data general <laughs> laws. One of them is the AI Act, and this is another um, act where the sense is that the European Union wants to play a leading role. Um, and, and give it that Brussels effect as well. I know that the EDPS plays a role in the enforcement of the AI Act. I wanted to um, ask you to share some thoughts in three minutes, perhaps, uh, on, on, um, on, on this entire issue of the AI Act and the role of a data protection authority like the EDPS in enforcing it, and the chances that it takes over uh, also, um, at least at standard level, around the world. Well, thanks. Uh, I think the AI Act certainly is the next big thing here in Brussels. Um, and interestingly, um, the drafters have proposed that we talk about enforcement, that there shouldn't be a centralized enforcement in the European Union. It's going to be the member states who have to uh, designate one or more national competent authorities, um, plus all the existing market surveillance authorities who are now today regulating product safety, should come in and uh, enforce uh, those rules, plus the financial supervisors, which are already existing. Uh, and yes, the proposal says you should have one AI supervisory authority who then coordinates at national level. And it's true. Um, at the level of European institutions, uh, offices, bodies and agencies, um, the draft says it should be the European Data Protection Supervisor with the power to even apply fines up to 500,000 euros. And the proposal says, and for doing that, um, the EDPS should get five more officials to do that work. <laughs> <laughs> Reality check, right? And I think very briefly, um, we stand ready for this. It's going to enable us to do, obviously, synergies with our data protection supervisory functions. But at the same time, it's not going to be just a minor add-on. Not at all. It will require, as, uh, as Teki said, a different set of skills. It will require us to have yet another set of tools um, because we need to be full market surveillance authority. We need to do, we need to do physical and laboratory checks. Um, that's going to be fun. And ultimately, it's, it's justified because we're not just talking about data protection. We are really talking about protection of privacy. We're talking about protection of human dignity, um, non-discrimination, essentially upholding the EU's values. That is going to be the object of enforcement, ultimately, for the AI Act. So how will this work? Um, I fully subscribe to the ambition in the EU to have a model to regulate artificial intelligence and AI systems um, the European Union way. We've heard about different ideas in the world. And it has great potential to become the GDPR 2.0, but ultimately it will need to work in practice. And it's the same topic as we see with the GDPR. If it doesn't work in practice, um, then it will be dead letter law and companies will not care. So um, effective, consistent enforcement, five components need to be there. And I hope that um, we won't have a conference in four years where we'll be discussing effective enforcement of the AI regulation. <laughs> Uh, th thank you very much for that. And before I will uh, ask Hilke to close us off, I want to give the opportunity for one burning question. Is there a burning question? Yes, we have a burning question. <laughs> Please, and, and if you could introduce yourself and, and then ask a question. Yes, uh, about, uh, my name is Alessandra. Um, I'm I am Brazilian, so forgive me for my bad English. It's, per <laughs> it's very good English. Okay. Uh, about the enforcement, uh, I, I have been watching 
people discuss enforcement about the documents, contracts, but the enforcement and really when when you need provide evidence, the, the company is not um, have concern about this. And the, I have been uh, participate with a project for adequacy, the price, and the people are concerned about uh, create policy and standards, but not create process, process that, that function in practice, in day to day. So uh, I think that, uh, just a moment, I make the, my, uh, I think that uh, privacy, you can achieve privacy in two ways, with laws and with data protection. But if you want to achieve the data protection, we need apply security information. And I think that it's missing the, the cyber security, the risk management mindset to make this enforcement more effective. This is it. It's my question is, what do you think about this, uh, the, the privacy, privacy, security information, and cyber security uh, must go hand in hand as a sisters? Because if you sold a hand, you can lose something. Uh, th thank you for raising that question, but uh, do you want to? Yes. Yes. Boyana Bellamy from CIPL. What do you think about the US-style settlements and FTC-style consent decrees? It seems to me they achieve better effect and better outcomes than fines. Uh, for example, thank you so much for, thank you, thank you so much for that question. Let's, so let's take these this two questions and if uh, any of the panelists would like to share thoughts on how cybersecurity should go hand in hand with uh, privacy and data protection law. And my sense was that there was also a, um, a sub-question on perhaps private type of enforcement, you know, how, how companies themselves are putting their house in order and create their processes and are taking the accountability seriously. Um, so, if, if uh, either of uh, the current regulators in the, in the room would like to uh, share a thought on that. And then, of course, uh, how about the U.S. style enforcement of, of settlements? Um, um, there's a lot to say. Uh, <laughs> I think in this stage, I think I have two minutes, so I will do that quickly. Uh, one thing I would say about security and information security that's definitely linked to what we are doing and it should also be part of it but it's not the only thing we do when we do privacy it's only part of it it's but it's, it's definitely linked to it i think uh, we should and that's for picking up on what anu bradford said before we should stick a bit to our values i think and our, we're, we're there as privacy regulators we cannot do everything uh, Another point which we should, and we are, we are confronted, and I think there's also a bit of a link with what I heard before today, we should, we are, with all these new acts, we have to risk, we run the risk, because also the AI Act, for instance, doesn't foresee necessarily that the data protection authorities get, get a role, apart from the EDPS, uh, that we are we're confronted with a big number of regulators, uh, all for different aspects of the same quite often. I think there, there is a real risk, and I think cooperation between regulators is, of course, uh, important, but it's also very difficult to do it practically on a day-to-day -day basis. If I see my day-to-day -day work, I'm, I do a lot on cooperation with other data protection authorities in the one sub shop mechanism. We need to enforce cases, we need to do, to do cases, and then at the same time cooperating, which we should, but it's, it's not so easy. So the more regulators we have, the more difficult it, it will be. Also consumer uh, authorities, for instance, that they're that is one other point I would make. About effectiveness, uh, the GDPR can only work if it's effective. That's clear. I think also uh, picking up on what Boyana Bellamy said, uh, when I went to the US a number of years ago, they always told me before the GDPR was there, you have these nice laws, we have the enforcement. That was always the, the mantra. And what's, what's more important, having the law or the enforcement? I think we should have them both and we need them both. And we also should think, and what, that's what we do, 
think about different instruments is not only about fines. The GDPR is not only about fines. The ideas of settlement, of, of amicable settlements are part of it. The, uh, the idea of, uh, of measures or, or, or of, of, of orders or, or all kinds of measures to, to change, to, 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 to really change the system can be much more effective, can be much more lead to accountability. I cannot uh, say, miss this word with you on the first row, Boyana, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> So accountability is another part, but I think we we talk all the time about fines, and that's good because there's we're talking about uh, Thomas again. The most visible part are the fines, and that's how people perceive it. They understand it when when fines are imposed, but it's not the only thing we do. And I think sometimes it I think it's more important to to try to see if we can uh, ensure. Uh, responsible data use when we can ensure uh, an ecosystem where data are used in a responsible manner where individuals really have control and that is not only with fines and other mechanisms can can be much more useful and i think also we can learn of course from the us but i think the toolbox which the, the gdpr gives to the dpas that's enormous we can do a lot we have i think 21 uh, powers in article 58 and 27 uh, uh, duties to, to fulfill. So there is a lot. Um, I think that's what I, uh, I would like to say. Last point, it's not only about the big tech. It's also good to remember that we do a lot of small cases. It's also good that we are there to, if people want access to their personal data, it was mentioned this morning as well, that we can do that quick and in an effective manner and have quick and short messages for it. <laughs> Well, on that positive note, uh, thank you so much, uh, Hilke, for um, uh, highlighting that there are many other ways in which uh, enforcement of data protection law is effective. Uh, I note that we are actually at time. Uh, one hour has passed. I also note that from now on, I will always come and moderate panels immediately after I land, because my sense is that this was a wonderful conversation. <laughs> so thank you uh, to, to my fellow panelists, uh, and, and I hope uh, you also enjoyed uh, the exchange of ideas here. Thank you all. Thank you.